Welcome to Sober Doc Coffee, a weekly coffee chat sharing experience, strength, and hope for anyone on the sober road to recovery. You can download Sober Doc Coffee weekly on all podcast platforms and check us out on Instagram at Sober Doc Coffee Podcast and on Twitter at Sober Coffee Pod. To learn more about us and to help support these sessions, visit online at Sober Doc Coffee. Here are your hosts, two guys on their own path to recovery, Mike and Glenn. Let's join them at the coffee shop. Glenn, hey, what up, buddy? Hey, good morning. Good morning, good morning. I'm ready. I, I probably need more coffee. No, come on. I love coffee. You got the tall boy? I love coffee. So, you know, hey, look, when, when we do these coffees, you know, and, and I've, I've gone back and listened to one or two of them, and I'm like, you know, there's one or two, like, what I think are good bullet points, mm-hmm. right, that, that, that come out of, you know, ones that you could write up on a flip chart, right, that you could think about, you could chew on for a right, while, right? right? We just, uh, we, last week we last had coffee week, with yeah. Dr. John, and there are like 40 to 90 bullet points that you could chew on, you know, almost write a book on them. I know, my, my, um, my pen ran out of ink. I, um, good stuff. I mean, and, and John, welcome back. Nice, nice to be back. Table it's for like, three. Yeah, table for three. Ding, 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 ding. Uh, yeah, it was just great stuff. And what we thought we'd do is pick up kind of right where we left off because uh, John's joined us to kind of talk about some uh, pivotal, you know, major, seminal, whatever word you want to use, lessons or breakthroughs in, in your journey through sobriety. And and uh, they've been impactful for me in the rooms. Some I've heard, some I haven't heard. Um Though, you know, and, and I'm not going to guide you a direction. I'm going to make sure that this coffee, though, there's a couple that I'd love for you to share that just made such a deep impact with me that pr- talk about scared straight. I mean, you said something in presentation and I, I hold on to it and have held on to it for five years now. And it keeps me on the straight course, even when that's not the best feeling thing to be doing. Yeah. It's good stuff. So. Yeah, there's there's one thing I like to chew on first before we start digging in, yeah. and, and came out of that last session. And you know, Doctor John, you said I'm either a ten or a zero, right? Yeah, right. Yes. Um, I can remember be, before my alcoholism even kicked in, right? Which about 35 years old, I, I, I really put in gear. I mean, I had a couple beers before that, but I mean, that's when it got in gear. Um, but even like early 20s, 20 years old, right? Right out of college, I I, re- I remember saying, you know. I'm either on the porch or I'm all in, right? It, I'm, I, you know, I remember seeing a T-shirt down the beach, you know, big dogs laying on the porch or something. I, I remember saying, that's me. I, I'm either just, you know, a zero on the porch mm-hmm. or I am all in. Mm-hmm. And, and it makes me think, and, and you know, I'd, I would love a solution to this. Sometimes I just accept, accept myself, but I call it morism. But, you, know, Brian, you just said, Glenn, when your alcoholism kicked in in your 30s, um, maybe it's semantics, but I was born alcoholic. Okay, when I talk about my ism, I'm talking about the way I'm wired. Uh, I don't have a scientific explanation for that, but I was born scared. <clears throat> it's almost as if God left some of the insulation out, made me a thin-skinned person, sent me through a thick-skinned world. So yeah, alcohol did not cause my alcoholism. You know, the alcoholism came first, and then I chased false gods to fill that void. Uh, they all worked for a while. In fact, I got good at stuff. When I come to A, they tell me their character defects. And in my, at 13, I discovered alcohol, and that gave me relief from my alcoholism better than anything else. All right, so, so, so question. Um, and I love semantics. Um, so what do you call alcoholism, which I, which I heard you say, with, if, if, some, if somebody has ism mm-hmm. without ever having drank alcohol? Mm-hmm. What do you call that ism? Ism. I think, ism. The, yeah, early in recovery, I used to think that I had this arrogant, uh, uh, chauvinistic view that we alcoholics are uniquely afflicted. Okay, that, you know, we're spiritual seekers. We have a hole in the soul, and all you earth people are just kind of plow horses. And my wife, God rest her soul, heard me expounding on that one day, and she turned she says, you guys don't suffer more than the rest of us. You just, you, you just don't suffer as well. <clears throat> mm-hmm. And I thought, you know, she has a point there. Maybe it's both. So in answer to your question, uh, my take on it is that the ism is universal. I think it's the human condition in capital letters. If you remember my Beagle Kate story, that was one of my epiphanies. And I looked at my, my Beagle laying there and I thought, why am I not as content as in the moment as centered as this darn dog? Okay. Uh, and suddenly you realize she is not afflicted by the ism. You know, there's a reason. There's a, 
oh, close to 100 different 12-step programs in existence. Okay? And they're, all, they're identical. I've gone to some of them. You know? I have the credentials for more than one. Mm-hmm. And what I learned is that they're identical, not just similar, identical to AA. They differ only at the portal of entry. So if the pain in your life is due to your addictive attachment to food, okay, you have the, uh, the uh, admission ticket for Overeaters Anonymous. Mm-hmm. If the pain in your life is due to your addictive attachment to your alcoholic loved one, you have the admission ticket for Elanon. So I think the ism is the human condition, in capital letters, meaning we are the only creatures on the planet that have the capacity to introspect, to torment ourselves with uh, regret for the past, fear of the future. Mm-hmm. Okay. All the other critters just live in the moment. They have instincts. So, do you would would you say that everybody is born with the ism? Yes. People just handle it differently. Yes. And to varying degrees. And I, I don't know how you measure that. Even within the program, I work with newcomers, and I've said to some people, I think you have the ism in spades. There's, and it's not how much they drink necessarily. Mm-hmm. They're so tormented. Uh, there are Gomer piles in the world. And if you remember, old Gomer. Gomer. Yeah, yeah, I've 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 known some, and I'm I'm amazed by them. Yeah. There are Gomer Piles, and I used to have this arrogant view that, you know, they're kind of dull, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm a thoroughbred, they're a plow horse. Mm-hmm. I'm a, <laughs> you know, I'm a, an Indy car, they're a clunker. But I've come to realize that when you get to know people, they're all broken. Mm-hmm. They're all, they may not be aware of it, and people don't want to deal with it, even in recovery. You know, it's not a popular message when I have meetings that I have alcoholism, not alcoholism. Why, well, you're just being cute. No, you know. I am more painfully aware today of step one than I was the day I walked in. Mm-hmm. I am more painfully aware of my brokenness. And I, don't, and I used to think that meant I was regressing. You know, when I have these episodes, when I have these grown epiphanies, like, oh, shit. You know, I'm not nearly there. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. You go through a spurt where everything makes It's almost the opposite, sense. right? You're almost progressing. You're almost... You feel like you're regressing, but I think when and sometimes maybe you are. I check with your sponsor, but maybe you just become more painfully aware. Right. Early on, my epiphanies were eureka epiphanies, like, oh, my God, a new insight. Mm-hmm. You know, and there's God in the trees, mm-hmm. you know, and, oh, I feel this deep connection. I'm at peace. The longer I'm sober, my epiphanies tend to be more grown epiphanies. Like, oh, shit. Mm-hmm. I had an experience real quick this, this week. I gave a talk at the center to the guys. Mm-hmm. I've given this talk a hundred times about the ism and the false mm-hmm. gods and all that. But, well, you know, the day before, I'm preparing and outlining. I, I could give this talk in my sleep. I'm preparing and outlining. And at 6 o'clock in the evening, I'm tired. Uh, I go to a meeting. A newcomer walks in and says, John, would you give the lead? Sure. So I give the lead. And it's basically the talk I gave about the ism. And halfway through the lead, and I'm being really on fire and articulate sure. and I just know him. I just know I'm saving her life <laughs> and, I, and she was rough she was either hung over or maybe a little bit under you know and I realized she's not hearing a thing nothing so I sit back I finally shut up and I observe the process one guy's holding her hand in, a, in an appropriate way mm-hmm. supportive way guys are sharing at a very rudimentary blue collar level and her eyes light up and I'm thinking to myself, you arrogant, self-centered <laughs> idiot. What are you preparing for? This is how the miracle works. Right. Not right. with your schemas and your explanations. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I love, Not too? Not with the PowerPoints. <laughs> you know, going back, going back to and this program for, lo- program for Living, and I think there's a book written called Program for Living that kind of outlines the 12 steps. And you're right, John, our price of admission, our admission ticket, was alcohol, mm-hmm. you know, but I know for a fact that there are listeners out there that listen to this podcast that don't struggle with alcohol. That's, but they continue to come back because they have that void in their life there yeah. and they're trying to figure their stuff out. The program is so spot on for anybody. The, the principles of this program have universal applicability. Yes. Okay. Dr. J- Scott Peck, who wrote the book, The Road Less Traveled. Mm-hmm. Not AA approved, but it sold millions of copies. And he was a, a very substantial guy. He was an p- advisor to President Bush and so on, psychiatrist. And uh, Dr. Peck said in one of his talks, uh, he believes that when the history of the 20th century is written, historians will view the singular event of the 20th century, the birth of 12-step programs. Mm-hmm. This is not an AA guy. Yeah. This is a board-certified, right, deep sure. this and and I, I heard that early in my recovery, some years later, he was in town giving a talk, 5,000 people down at the Conrad Hilton. And I went up to him. I said, Dr. Peck, did I hear you right? He said, absolutely. He said, I believe 
And again, this is not a recovering, although I think he should have been, but he said he believes that if governments and corporations would adopt 12-step philosophy, we would transform the world. Mm-hmm. And I think that's true. Yeah. yeah it's funny, we're involved with a, with a men's group, 19 guys, <clears throat> and, and we've talked about that several times, is having, you know, going through the 12 steps with non-AA people. Mm-hmm. You know, because it's a phenomenal. Right. Phenomenal. I've, I've given my, my talk about the ism, you guys have heard it, yeah. mm-hmm. uh, to conventions that are not alcoholics. And I used to preface it by saying, I'm not going to ask how many of you are recovering alcoholics, the anonymity. But if you are human, okay, listen to what I have to share for you. Mm-hmm. If your false gods are still working for you, if your void is still filled and you're comfortable with success or love or room, whatever. Money, whatever. Uh, but let me plant a seed because your garden of Gethsemane is coming. Hmm. There will come a time in your life when you realize, what am I really all about? Right? Mm-hmm. And maybe then that seed that I plant today will take root. Hmm. Man, that's, that's, I've never heard you say that. It's yeah. amazing. Yeah, it's outstanding. Can outstanding. I tell my Samantha story? Please, yes. Yeah. Love the Samantha story. Yes. I'm aware of the time. One of the most powerful moments in my recovery, <laughs> and I hesitate to tell dog stories because I've been to meetings where people say, oh, I had a dog once too, you know. I like It's, it's not about dogs. I'm trying right. to share a, <laughs> totally. a powerful moment. I totally mo- miss it, man. Powerful moment. I've already told the Beagle Kate, you know, that she doesn't have the ism. Samantha's story. I'll make it as quick as I can. After Kate, the Beagle, finally found a hole in the fence, got run over, uh, we had to put her down. The boys and I, my sons were 10, 10, and 11 at the time. Went to the pound, adopted a dog. We called her Samantha. I'll, I'll skip the details. But Samantha and I had almost a mystical bond. If you're a dog lover, I think you'd appreciate this. I wanted to take all the dogs home. But Samantha, it was something very special. I mean, this dog never left my side. She was big as a cow. I mean, she was, I think, part Great Dane and part... She was a mix. Sadly, after a short period, a few months, she got very sick. And we did the loving thing. Scott Peck says, love is doing what is best for the beloved. Broke my heart. We had to put her down. A couple of days later, I'm going through my morning meditations. Uh, Cecilia said, every, every day you start with them, one hour of prayer meditation. So I'm sitting there thinking, why do I miss this dog so much? And I'm not weird. I don't put the ashes on the man's body. I was really sad. And then this happened in a nanosecond. It'll take at least three minutes to, tell, to share it with you. Uh, why do I miss her? My first thought is, I know why. I mean, she wasn't a pedigree. She didn't know any tricks. She cost me a small fortune. Towards the end, I was cleaning up her puke and her poop. And I thought, why do I miss her? Ah, I know, because she gave me unconditional love. I thought, now, wait a minute, that's not true. If I didn't feed her and rub her belly and treat her as well as I did, she would have found another master. Then my next thought is, she afforded me an opportunity to give unconditional love. I come home from work, take off my tie, roll on the floor, uh, rub her belly, she'd lick my face, I'd lick her face. No ego, no expectations, no motive. Just pour myself into her, even cleaning up her poop. I didn't resent it. Mm-hmm. I just wanted to do for her. My next thought is, that's the only need I have, is to give love unconditionally. I have a lot of wants. Mm-hmm. I want to be loved unconditionally. I want to be admired. I want to be applauded. But the only need I have is to give love unconditionally. And the next thought, and this happens, zip, zip, zip. Mm-hmm. If I could love my fellow man mm-hmm. the way I love that dog, I would know heaven on earth. Mm-hmm. And isn't that what the program is about? Isn't that Absolutely. What, isn't that yeah. what the program is about? You yeah. can't keep it unless you give it away. You mentioned earlier, why do I keep going to meetings? I ask myself t- sometimes, because I don't feel better after every meeting. Mm-hmm. Now, part of it is I'm retired and I don't have a life and it structures my time. You know, uh, but it's an opportunity to give and connect. Mm-hmm. My dear friend Stella, who you both mm-hmm. know, uh, has, has shared with me the opposite of addiction is connection. And I've been saying that for years when I talk about the ism. Mm-hmm. It's a hole in the soul. It's a yearning for wholeness, a yearning for connectedness. But I had to hear Stella say that. That's it. The yearning for connection. Why do I go to meetings? Structure my time. Gives me something to do. Give it away. The only way I know how to get out of my ism is to pour myself into a human Samantha. It's amazing how that works. Yeah. It's amazing how so so a couple things. Have have you started to find heaven on earth? I've had tastes of it. When I pour myself into another, when I pour myself into another, I can't tell you, and I'm sure you've had the experience. And my God has a perverse sense of humor. 
I can tell you how often I've been in the midst of crisis, when my wife was on her deathbed, um, when I was in, in intensive care with a poor prognosis, okay, the phone rings, one of my sponsees. Okay, and I'm like, I have nothing to give. I feel like a, excuse my language, I feel like a tit sucked dry. Okay, but the program says you pick up the phone, right? Ten minutes later, the guy's in crisis. Ten minutes later, I'm out of myself. I'm not grieving. I'm not full of fear. Um, so I don't know what heaven is, but the closest I've come to it is when I lose myself in another. Mm -hmm. John, you strike me as well as somebody who has a des deep desire to learn as much about this as you can. I mean, it was your, not only your, are you a recovering alcoholic, but it was your profession as well to help other mm -hmm. uh, recovering alcoholics and drug addicts. And um, do you find yourself still learning at this point to the same pace that you were early on? You know, it's, it's the same lessons, but at a deeper and deeper level. Like the experience I just shared uh, uh, when I was preparing for my talk, and, and then I go to the meeting, and, you know, everything I ever learned, everything I need to know in life, I learned in kindergarten. There's a mm -hmm. book out like that. Yeah. You know, the simple basic truths I learned early on, but I seem to have to relearn them at a deeper and deeper and deeper level. Mm -hmm. It's not learning like a linear process mm -hmm. you know it gets more and more complicated mm -hmm. I, I continue to learn yeah and i think we're all wounded healers to each other mm -hmm. you know i cringe a little bit it's very flattering when people say you know dr john this dr john, john that uh we are all broken in the same way we're wounded healers to each other you know that's what connects us and the learning has to take place okay the, this connection i talk about i have a hard time connecting to people who seem to have their void filled i won't mention names but if, been down in Florida, and there's a great group down there, and if they ever hear this, hey, guys. Uh, but there's one fellow that I was having a conversation with, and he's a good guy. He's been sober for 15, 18 years, and uh, we had this conversation, and, it's, and he doesn't have a sponsor. And uh, I said, uh, don't, don't you need a sponsor? No, no. I, didn't. I said, well, I still have a blind spot. He says, oh, I can see my blind spots now. <laughs> I said, that's an oxymoron. Yeah, that's totally right, By man. definition. That's ego in motion right there. Uh, and he's a good guy, and he, he helps a lot of people. I said, well, I said. He could be a better guy. I said, you know, I have alcoholism. Do you think you have alcoholism? Yes. He says, I'm recovering. Do you think you recover? I, I don't, I'm not, I don't want him to hear this and feel like I'm picking him. What I'm, my point is that I have a hard time connecting with people whose void is filled with whatever it is, you know. I'm getting too long-winded. We talk about it's a re not a religious program, it's a spiritual program. And I'm not a theologian, I'm not sure exactly, but nobody ever really elaborates what the difference is. And I think one big difference is religion fills the void. Spirituality teaches me to embrace the void. Okay? Hmm. I spent too many years in this program expecting my void to be filled. Okay? For years and years and years, I judged myself harshly that I'm not a good AA. Because even though I know comparing myself to others is unwise because I'm comparing my insides with their outsides, we still do it, right? Mm -hmm. And many times I'd sit at a meeting, my ism eating me alive, feeling restless, irritable, discontent, and people would talk about how grateful they are, how happy, joyous, they, they live in the moment, they just give it to God. And I think, what am I doing wrong? Why am I not getting this? You know? mm -hmm. And gradually it dawned on me that the program I take on it is not to fill that void and take my ism away. When I say I have alcoholism, I'm not being cute. Mm -hmm. okay? I still tick that way. But the program helps me to suffer better, mm -hmm. to embrace the void, to grow from that pain. And uh, not to be uh, theological, but metaphorically speaking, I have come to believe that my ism is God's finger poking at me. Because mm -hmm. were it not for that inner turmoil, that not knowing, you wouldn't that do anything seeking, about it. why would I be here? Right. Yeah, right. Why would I go to a meeting? Absolutely. Then I, then I go and... That's a patronize great point. and be condescending. Oh, mm -hmm. someday you'll be spiritual like me. Mm -hmm. you know, someday your void will be filled. Mm -hmm. It's a never-ending process. It's a never-ending, and that's what I love about your grid is that it ke the cycle keeps coming because eventually, what I found your grid to be so true in my life is that I'll be filled momentarily, mm -hmm. maybe even for a couple of days. Sure. I'll, I'll get a new set of speakers for my office. I'm happy. I'm right. content. Right. And then all of a sudden I look at my neighbor who gets got a nicer set of speakers and I'm now I'm not so quite yeah. content with my speakers. I want the next grade up and it's never ending. Yeah. So, so, so I've got a couple things here. Let's just call them espresso shots. Cause I've been taking notes here. Um, one is you mentioned 
they you know they can't hurt me mm, right? right and 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 I I read a book from this guy David Goggins called They Can't Hurt Me or mm. You Can't Hurt Me, and 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 what I've learned in this program in in sobriety is um, if you're doing the right things, there's there's no situation that I can't get through. Mm-hmm. Period. I mean, there's no situation that I can't get through. And then I like to add sober. Um, just too much proof, right? Yeah. Doesn't matter what happens out there; it just doesn't matter. I've got the tools, I've got the connections, the community today. I ask for help, right? I'm outside of my ego, and I'm like, "Hey, first thing I do is ask for help these days, right?" Um, second thing is, and and I need to really ponder this a lot more. I just want to underline it: um, <clears throat> the religion to me is a bunch of rules. Mm-hmm. It's a bunch of man-made bullshit rules. Mm-hmm. Um, and 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 spirituality to me today is a relationship with my God, right? And one of the things you said earlier was about community. You know, the, the we, the community, you know, I'm sure you've heard about the Rat Park experiment, right? Mm. And, and, and so maybe that relationship is my community with God, and, right. right? And that, that, that certainly helps. You know, I love what you said about learning the same lessons, just going deeper. Uh, that, that really hit me. And then last espresso shot here was, you know, Scott Peck, love him, didn't love him for a while because you've mentioned that book for quite a number of years. And, and so I'm, I'm like, well, Dr. John has so many epiphanies. I'm going to go get that book. So I get the book and I, I sit down in my nice easy chair, my cup of coffee. And, and the first fucking sentence is <laughs> life is hard. Life is difficult. Where, 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 and, where'd the book go? Oh, I, I close that. I'm like, this is bullshit. I'm not. Re- I don't want hard. Right. I want it easy. And I literally put that book on the shelf for a year. I was cleaning up my shelf. I'm like, and and then my headspace was in a different place a year or so later. And then I read it and I embraced it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I'd like to like to jump on to uh, because I I love what you said there. There's nothing in life that you can't handle, right? That that you know you can't get. Okay. You say handle, I can't get through. Can't get through. Sometimes I think I can't handle. Well, here, here's the thing, and because I, I got to get to my scared straight moment, right? That old movie where you know, scared straight, and people would watch that movie and be like, "Oh, I'm never doing, never bringing drugs into a foreign country. That's terrible." My scared straight moment came from uh, Doctor John because he would pontificate and <laughs> share his journey and his experience. I'm thinking this guy's never struggled with picking up again, right? Never struggled with picking up again. Can, can you take me back? Because y- you did. You you made the conscious decision after a yeah. decade plus of sobriety. Mm-hmm. You made the con- so I, and I can't, I couldn't imagine that. And yeah. so I listened with my ears wide open because that's my biggest fear is going back out there. Can you talk about going back out there? Every bottom has a trap door in it. You know, mm-hmm. I chuckle when people say I really hit my rotten and my rock bottom this time. I hit my twentieth bottom. Yeah. 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 And I think, I said, well, time will tell. The mm-hmm. litmus test is, have you had enough pain to be willing to follow through? I had 15 years in the program, uh, active sobriety. I worked in the field. Uh, I sponsored people. Uh, <clears throat> and in hindsight, again, in hindsight, apparently I became complacent. I got bored. And I got busy with life. I never quit. I never said I don't need AA. I never said I'm not an alcoholic. I just went from five meetings a week to three meetings a week uh, to one meeting a week. We had our fourth child. Um, I, I made a career change, et cetera, et cetera, built that house the wife always wanted. And for two years, that thing was fine. Never thought of drinking. And in my mind, I thought I'm still an A, but I didn't go to meetings. And I lost contact with my peeps. Uh, my sponsor passed away. I didn't get another one. My sponsees drifted away. I didn't uh, go after them. So everything was fine. And uh, one day I'm in Flagstaff, Arizona. Ironically, you know, people talk about the triggers. I think triggers are just excuses. Give me two minutes in my own head, and I'll trigger myself. I'm in a motel in Flagstaff, Arizona, on my way to the Betty Ford Center to apply for the assistant director position. A good friend of mine, Dr. West, was the medical director, and uh, I was going to interview with him. So I stopped in Flag. I made a road trip out of it. I'm at this motel. Now, people say we have a thinking problem. I cringe. My problem is much deeper than my thinking. My, my problem is in here, in my, in my soul, in my heart, in my DNA. I'm at this uh, hotel. And out of the clear blue comes a thought, wouldn't it be nice to get drunk? Wouldn't it be nice to get a buzz? And I thought it through very carefully. I thought, if I just get drunk tonight, I'm pissing away 15 years of sobriety. 
and if I keep drinking, there's a lot of yets waiting for me out there. Therefore, I concluded very intelligently, reasonably, I should not do this. Great pretty, end of the story. Pretty clear thing. Great end of the story. That would ah, but then my ism said, "Oh, screw it. Oh, screw it. Oh, you know, who'll know? It doesn't count in Flagstaff. <laughs> it you know, doesn't who, count in Flagstaff. Who, who's it going to hurt? Yeah, until you bring it back, road, road yeah. trip across yeah. the country. And then I, I didn't stay drunk. You know, I got drunk that night. I was cool. But then it got easier the next time. Mm-hmm. Two, three weeks later, I thought, well, that worked out okay. Yeah, didn't right. hurt anybody. Yeah. And it was easier the next time. Mm-hmm. And then I lived in limbo. Okay, I'm not going to lie and say my, my life went straight downhill. I was always a controlled, uncontrolled mm-hmm. drinker. But I was in limbo, you know. Nothing worse than a head full of A and a belly full of booze, you know. Mm-hmm. I was just oh, miserable. Geez, that's yeah. awesome. Yeah, just miserable. So, you know, so we uh, talk a lot about relapse. I mean, a lot of our listeners, man, a lot of pain from, from, from relapses. And, and there's a lot of hugs. Oh, John, John, that's okay, man. Don't mm. hate. Everybody relapses. John, that's all. Hey, John, come here. Let me give you a hug. Mm, right? No. Um, you know, I'm, I was there because I wanted those hugs. I wanted the welcome back. And, and we always welcome everybody right. back. We don't shoot the but, wounded. But I wanted the hugs, man. But what I've learned now is, is relapse is a fire alarm. Something's not going right. And unfortunately, we've gone to funerals of people mm. who have relapsed. And and, and, and 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 I love when people say relapse doesn't define you. Mm-hmm. Right? I'm a lot of people out there in social media, we got a lot of follow you know, relapse doesn't define you. The fuck it doesn't. Yeah. If you die. Well right? what I say, what I say is uh, hate the sin, love the sinner. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. You know, I love you, but I don't approve of what you did. Mm-hmm. So I when talk to relapse, right? Because I I've learned through study or from learning from others is that there's you know, three stages of relapse, right? The emotional relapse, call that the ism, right? Then, then there's, so, so that's, hey, things, are, things aren't going right. I'm not feeling peace. I'm, you know, it's the ism, right? And then the, the second one is the mental, right? Where I start to think, just like you in that motel room. Yeah. yeah. Oh, man, wouldn't it be great? Hey, I'm not, and you start to rationalize. And then the physical when you ask sure. to drink, right? I live half of my life in the emotional I mean, I, I, I probably, I mean, full transparency, I probably do. I mean, I, I got the ism all going all the time. Now, I'm always using tools, right? It's like a, sometimes a finger in the dike. I've always got different fingers in the dike, right? But, but I, I don't let it extend. There are some times I go to the mental. There are some times today I'm like, I remember when. Hey, I got a boring Tuesday afternoon and a bunch of phone calls. I remember when I had my big solo cup. And boy, that, those, those meetings went great. I always forget the six detoxes I went right. to after that, right? right. Um, you know, and, and, and so I, I think awareness, and, and you've mentioned that several times, is, you know, and there's also people I know, you know, who hold me accountable, who call me up. Hey, I haven't seen you in a meeting in a couple of days. Hey, man, the last meeting you were at, you are a little bit off. You know, I know we're running out of time, and if there's any new people out there listening, what I want them to know is I don't tell newcomers, if you quit drinking, everything's going to be okay. Now, life will get better. You're not going to puke in the morning. You won't get a DUI. But life is still life, you know. I've had more losses in the last five, six years than I'd had in all my years of drinking. And I don't tell them if you come into AA, you're going to feel great. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you will, sometimes you won't. But I do tell them, if you come in and do this to the best of your ability, you will get well in spite of yourself, and you'll be the last to see it. Okay? I think this is the best therapy on the planet. I said that the last time I was here. Unless you have a major mental disease, of schizophrenia or something, some people need to be on medication. Okay? Mm-hmm. But I think alcoholism is the great masquerader of psychiatric illness. I think there's a lot of people who are taking psychotropic meds that they probably don't need to be on. That's a whole subject unto itself. Mm-hmm. Um, but Don't get me started. Mm-hmm. But, uh, but I'm convinced that, that this is the best therapy because unlike all the other therapies, it aims not just at feeling better, it, it aims at getting well. There's a difference. And the, and the program has taught me that insight in 50 cents or $2 to get you a cup of coffee. Mm-hmm. You know? uh, $7 now, Jack. Yeah. And you know, my colleagues, uh, professional colleagues, not going to like to hear. And there's nothing wrong with feeling better. There's nothing wrong with mm-hmm. symptom relief. There's a, a guy recently that's come back and he's really, really struggling. And he's, he's incapacitated with depression and anxiety. And I referred him to a colleague. You know, the adjunctive use of meds may be helpful, but this program is the best thing since sliced bread. Yeah. Well, that takes me back. First of all, I, I almost, thanks for landing the plane. I, I almost don't want to say, you know, continue, because I, I, I love that summation. Um, but I remember sitting in 
you know, Rush sitting in, Dr. Scheffner sitting in front, 10 PhDs. I knew him. We were going to figure out why you drink, and we're going to get you to stop. Mm -hmm. I had a lot of hope in that. Yeah. The only thing that's worked for me is a, a change in my life. He meant well, but they don't teach spirituality in medical school. Mm. I heard no spirituality words coming no. out of that program. I just didn't. And, and they, they do mean well, and I had a lot of hope and belief in them because I really needed a solution. They just weren't a solution. Well, here's, the, here's what, what bridged for me with our relationship, John, is that um, through, through my early days when I needed everybody's words, I, I hung on them. I needed them so desperately. And you never really talked about spirituality in the way that I perceived spirituality, right? So you didn't talk about a God of the universe. You didn't talk about what you talked about was a spiritual malady. Mm -hmm. And and that forced me to go back and figure figure out what my spirituality meant to me. So, you you never came off to me as spiritual. As a matter of fact, one of my favorite jokes is is and I can't tell it as good as you, but you know, if somebody claims to be spiritual, you go <laughs> you know grab your wall and put your hands across your yeah. genitals and protect yourself, right? Reverend Phil Hansen, look out for the holy ones. Look out for the holy <laughs> somebody ones. Somebody tells you they're spiritual, grab your wallet and your crotch and run like hell. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> um, but but just go, going back, I mean, I, I so appreciate you sharing that experience of uh, Flagstaff because uh, Flagstaff made you who you are. And again, relapse is not part of everybody's story. But, you know, I, I sat through many meetings where they remind me that alcohol is cunning, baffling, and powerful. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and it can, in fact, jump up and grab me. I was at a baseball game not too long ago with the family, and my wife was off two sections over getting cotton candy. My daughter was two sections the other way getting autographs from players. And I'm sitting right there by the beer vendor, and I'm thinking to myself, what up? One beer. I mean, it just came flooding over me. Sure. Um, but you sat in Flagstaff, and you intellectually walked through the process and yet went back there yeah. again. That scared me straight because I have, I have confidence today, but boy, am I cautious with it. Because There's a part of me that's always going to want to drink. I sure. Don't, I right. don't understand that's people who point. say, stop working for me. Right. I never want to drink again. I think, and then, what do you need AA for? That's right. I, uh, I'm not obsessed by it, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I have to be reminded of what it did to me. Right. But it always is something for me. Mm -hmm. Give me that relief Absolutely. for myself. Right, right. Good stuff. That brain marker. Any any final uh, stories or analogies you want to lay out before we? Uh, yeah, we're pretty much out of time, aren't we? Yeah, we're getting wax, there. But wax, give me, give me. Wax on, oh, wax yeah, off. yeah. <laughs> we always got time for a little Daniel. The, the, the perfect metaphor, in my opinion, for the sponsor sponsor relationship. In fact, for recovery, is the Karate Kid story, and I don't have time to tell it all, but. And the kid is the sponsee, of course, and the kid could not make himself a champion. And when he had enough pain, he went to the old man and said, will you help me? And Mr. Miyagi, who was just a humble janitor, said, yeah, I can help you, but there's one condition. You learn, I teach. The kid who's in a ton of pain doesn't argue, sure, I'll do anything you say. Go wax my cars. That made no sense, but the kid felt willing. So he goes out there and he waxes. Well, a little bit later, a few days later, his pain subsides. Eagle kicks back in and understandably sticks out his puny chest and says, this is not what I need. You don't understand, blah, 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 blah. The old man in his wisdom does not explain. That's why I make a lousy sponsor. I always explain things mm -hmm. to my, pay, my uh, sponsees. The old man uh, says to me, hey, if you, if you want to do it your way, go back and do it your way. I mm -hmm. didn't call you. You know, I don't need my car's wax. Secondly, he said, why don't you try to keep an open mind? Allow for the possibility I can see things you can't see. In the meantime, wax the frickin' cars. Honest, open, willing. To me, it's a God story. Mm -hmm. The kid could not make himself well or a champion. The old man couldn't fix him. A sponsor can't cure me. Okay? But if the kid, the sponsor, does his part, which is be honest, and that doesn't mean don't lie. Mm -hmm. He told him uh, his negative feelings and his doubts and his skepticism. He shared his thoughts with me. He allowed for the possibility, and most importantly, willing. He took directions. He asked for direction, took directions. The sponsor's job is twofold. Number one, don't judge. When the kid said, this is bullshit, I don't know, he didn't scold him. He didn't say, oh, you shouldn't feel that way, you shouldn't think that way. He said, I get it, I understand. Okay? And advised him to the best of his ability. He was not a karate master. He was just a humble janitor. Waxing cars is not an efficient way to learn karate. Mm -hmm. That misses the point. The point of the story is, you can't fix you. I can't fix you. Mm -hmm. But if you do your part, sponsor, mm -hmm. come to me with your pain. I'll do my part. I'll... 
not judge you, okay? Mm -hmm. And I'll guide you to the best of my ability because I'm not blinded by your blind spot. Somehow the healing takes place. Mm -hmm. Outstanding. Awesome. Love Dr. That. John, always love having you in here. Yeah, always love time. having coffee with you. Great being here. Yeah. I enjoyed it. Thanks so much for having me. We have, we have them every summer. <laughs> we just don't, we just don't awesome. get them in the winter. That's awesome. And I can't I blame them it. at all. John, thank it. you so much, thank man. You, really guys. appreciate you. Good to see you. Thanks for all what you do, man. Appreciate it. See you, Glenn. Thanks for joining us for today's Coffee Chat. To contact the show, email us at podcast at sober.coffee. If you need immediate help, the AA hotline is 800-839-1686. The National Suicide Prevention Hotline is 800-273-8255. Remember, Mike and Glenn are sharing their own journey on the path to recovery. Any suggestions, medical or otherwise, are their own experiences and should not be viewed as professional advice. See you next week, and remember, there is a solution. Stay safe in the city of Chicago.